Oh, I was going to bring breakfast up to you. Bill, you're wonderful. Oh, Dr. Allen. Uh, yes, Mrs. Allen. Are you as nice to your patients as you are to me? Always to your tongue. Oh, Bill. <laughs> oh, Bill. <laughs> well, it was a nice breakfast anyway. <laughs> Oh, I'll pay no attention. This is the last day of our honeymoon. But, Bill, it might be a patient. Oh, it's Dad and Sue. Hey. Come on in. Hello, there. Hello. Hello. Hello, Peggy. Hello, How are you doing down here, Dad? We're on our way to Chicago. Yeah, Dad's going to give a talk on nutrition at a medical meeting, and I just came along for the ride. So we thought we'd spend the day with you and Peggy. We don't have to be there until late tomorrow. Oh, swell. Well, I'm so glad you can stay. Oh, Peggy, we're so glad to stay. Oh, that. Think nothing of it. Come on, let's go in the living room. Bill. Bill? We'll be right in, Sue. Oh, Bill, what am I going to do about dinner? Oh, don't worry about it. We'll go out. Well, Bill, that isn't the thing to do. After all, this is the first time your folks have been here, and... Oh, honestly, Bill, I'm just scared to death to cook for your sister. Well, what's my sister got to do with it? Well, she's a famous home economist. She teaches three million women how to cook. After all, you can't feed a home economist just anything. Who's worried about feeding what to whom? <laughs> oh, you... Where's this kid? Go on in the living room, Bill, and talk to Dad. Let's take care of this. Now, Peggy, don't you worry about dinner. We'll get dinner together. Oh, but Sue, I haven't a thing in the house. All right. First thing we'll do is go shopping. And you can go on day after day serving different cuts of meat without ever repeating yourself. I know your meat dealer will be glad to show you how to get the most for your meat dollar. Good morning, Mrs. Drew. Oh, good morning, Mr. McCabe. What will you have this morning? Well... I think I'll have a three-rib roast off the small end of that beef rib, please. Yes, Mr. Drew. Right there is a fine example of just how supply and demand govern meat prices. Almost everybody wants the roast from the small end of the rib because they think it's better. So long as all the women compete for that piece, the price is bound to be higher. That's a nice piece of meat, isn't it? It sure is, Mrs. Drew. Look at it. See this marbling of fat with the lean? And this smooth covering of fat, there's two sure signs of quality. And here's a piece of meat with less fat. It'll make a very fine roast, too. He's right. It's really a matter of preference. Thank you. Good morning. How do you do? This is Mrs. Allen. She just moved into the neighborhood. Oh, yes. How do you do? I'm glad to know you. I know your husband, Dr. Allen. And I'm Miss Allen, the doctor's sister. Would you mind showing us what a nice pot roast and what delicious steaks you can get from the large end of that beef rib you were just cutting? Not at all. Say, you talk as though you know something about the meat business. She ought to. She's a famous home economist. Hmm. I guess I'll have to watch my step. You see here, Mrs. Ellen? Only the thickness of this knife separates these two pieces of meat. So there can't be very much difference between them. In tenderness, flavor, and nutritive value, you mean? That's it. Yet Mrs. Drew paid more for her roast just because nearly everyone wants cuts from the small end of the rib. Oh, but that roast is so big. Yes, but this is an accommodating piece of meat. We separate it into two pieces, and then remove the cartilage. Now I can roll this boneless piece into a pot roast good enough for anybody's Sunday dinner. Now this piece will make as fine a roast as the small end of the rib. Or can you imagine anything nicer than four country club steaks cut from this tender inside section? Yes, I can. Two steaks, each about two inches thick. She's got the right idea, Mrs. Allen. They'll be full of flavor and much juicier when broiled thick. There's nothing better than a nice, thick steak. Now this part from around the bone is just right for lean beef stew. And how about meatloaf or beef patties? That's right. Gracious, all those dishes from that one cut? Well, certainly, dear. All at bargain prices and all just as good. Sure, and it's the same with a whole side of beef. Women ask for about six popular cuts. There's that rib roast. And then there's round steak, sirloin, porterhouse, 
T-bone, and club steak. Altogether, the sections from which these cuts are made amount to about 30% of the entire side of beef. Add in 10% for trimmings, and you still have 60%, well over half the side of beef women hardly ever call for. A wide variety of economical meat cuts that are just as tender and appetizing as porterhouse steak or rib roast. It's money in your pocket when you start asking for the fine cuts from that other 60%. There's rump and heel pot roast, pin bone sirloin steak deluxe, cuts from the plate, brisket and shank, arm and blade pot roasts, country club steaks, blade rib pot roast and short ribs. Most people know little or nothing about these fine cuts, so they go begging while my customers continue to bid against each other for those few cuts they do know about. Excuse me. Good morning, Mrs. Adams. Good morning. Let me see. I'd like a nice roast for five people. How about a cushion-style shoulder of lamb? Oh, that's fine. I hadn't thought of that. We have cushioned shoulder of lamb at home quite often. The shoulder is just as tender as the leg. And look, when the bones are removed like that, it's easy to carve. The opening where the bones came from makes a perfect pocket for dressing. Certainly is a beautiful cut. Yes, isn't it? And lamb is so delicious. Thank you. Leg of lamb and lamb chops are the only lamb cuts I've ever heard of. Of course. Women come in here who have been cooking for 40 years, and all they ever ask for is leg of lamb, loin chops, and rib chops. These three cuts add up to only 52% of the lamb. Well, we've got figures to show that 85% of all the demand for lamb is for this half. Allow 5% for trimmings, and you still have well on toward half the lamb, 43% to be exact, that no more than 15 out of 100 women ever ask for. Such delicious cuts as rolled breast and cushion-style shoulder, lamb riblets, lamb trotters, neck slices, Saratoga chops and shoulder chops, and mock duck, an attractive economical cut made from the top part of the shoulder. <laughs> well, isn't that the cutest thing? You know, there's more... The Cape's Market. All right, Mrs. Walters. I'll send it right over. There's another example of just what we've been talking about. That lady wants a center cut piece of ham. Just like most women. That's right, but this ham has plenty of other good cuts, too. Take this ham butt, for instance. It'll be fine for baking. But wouldn't the bone make it difficult to carve? Oh, no, not the way Mr. McCabe's cutting it. That piece is fine for seasoning vegetables. And this practically boneless piece is for baking or for butterfly ham slices. Suppose we have Mr. McCabe cut a butterfly slice for Bill's breakfast, Peggy. Oh, it suits me. And I know Bill will like it. Butterfly slice it is. It gets me why people always ask for center cut slices when they can buy attractive cuts like this. Well, that takes care of breakfast. Well, what about dinner tonight? There are only four of us. A pork roast from the rib end of that loin would be nice. Here's one about the right size. Oh, fine. Bill loves pork. Break the backbone from the rib so it'll be easy to carve. Mmm, that looks fine. But does everyone ask for only a few cuts of pork like they do beef and lamb? They sure do. Everybody wants center cut ham slices, center cut pork chops, breakfast bacon and spare ribs. But these make up less than a third of a side of pork. Allow another 21% for lard, and you still have 48%, almost half a side of fine meat people seldom ask for. Ham shank, butterfly ham slices, sirloin pork roast, country-style backbones, Boston-style butt, cushion-style shoulder, pork hocks, smoked jowl square, smoked shoulder butt, smoked picnic shoulder, and pig's feet. I'll tell you the perfect example of what we've just been talking about. It's calves liver. Not many years ago, we almost gave it away. Then doctors began recommending calves liver for people with pernicious anemia. And now there's hardly enough to go around. Doctors tell us that lamb, beef, and pork liver are just as good, but people still demand calves liver. Well, naturally, that affects the price. It's the same way with other cuts. Meat prices go according to supply and demand, just like anything else. Do you get the point, Mrs. Allen? I certainly do. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. It's been very interesting. Glad to do it. You know, Sue, 
There must be millions of women like me wanting what to have for dinner. And if they only knew it, they could have something different for the menu and save money, too. Did you know there are more than 125 different cuts of beef, pork, lamb, and veal? Why, you could have a different cut of meat every day for, oh, for three and a half months. Not counting the wide variety of sausage and luncheon meats. And meats put up in cans and jars. So you see, Peggy, buying meat can really be fun. But tell me, Sue, is cooking meat as much fun? Peggy, turn on the oven. Where shall I set it, Sue? 350 degrees. Now, if it were beef, veal, or lamb, we'd make it 300. Oh, I'd have guessed much higher for any of them. You aren't alone. But you put your finger right on the fundamental rule of meat cookery. If we've learned anything at all in 15 years of research, it's to cook meat at a low temperature. Now, the oven regulator controls the oven time. And we should have a meat thermometer to control the cooking time. Oh, I believe I have one. See now. Yep. Wedding present. Good. I didn't even know what it was good for. <laughs> a meat thermometer tells you when the roast is done. It's the only accurate way. <laughs> Won't ring a bell, but a quick glance will show you when the roast is done just the way you want it. Beef rare, medium, well done. Veal, ham, lamb, and fresh pork, well done at 185 degrees. With this gadget, you could go to the movies and leave the roasting to Bill. Even he could get the roast done exactly as you like it. There you are. Nothing to think about for a while. Well, that didn't look so hard. It isn't. Meat cookery isn't complicated. Actually, there are only two ways to cook meat. Two? Well, I thought there were dozens and dozens. Oh, recipes, yes. But methods? Just two. You mean that there's only... I mean dry heat and moist heat. And we have three examples of cooking oh, by dry heat. Oh, I want to write this down. Ready? Dry heat methods. Roasting, broiling, and pan broiling. And under moist heat, we have braising, and cooking in water. Now, let's see if I have this right. Under dry heat, there's roasting, broiling, and pan broiling. And under moist heat, we have braising and cooking in water. Well, that makes the whole subject of cooking meat seem a lot easier. Cooking meat is easy. All we need to do is observe a few simple rules which are founded upon extensive research. I wish you could be with us sometime in our test kitchen for one of our meat cookery demonstrations. We'll begin with our first dry heat method, roasting. This is a tender cut of beef, and the first thing we'll do is season it with salt and pepper. You can season a large piece of meat like this before cooking, during cooking, or after. It really makes no difference. Always put a roast in the pan this way, fat side up. Then it will baste itself. Basting must have been invented by some man who believed a woman's place was in the kitchen. And basting a roast was a good way to keep her there. Notice particularly that I haven't added any water. The drippings won't burn because we use a low temperature. And if you're wondering why there's no cover on the pan, remember that roasting is cooking by dry heat. If the roast were covered, it would be surrounded by steam. And of course, steam is moist heat. Our roast will get along without any watching on our part. So let's take a look at the other two methods of cooking by dry heat. Broiling and pan broiling. You can use exactly the same cuts for one method as for the other, as long as they are the more tender cuts. The essential difference between broiling and pan broiling is the way the heat reaches the meat. In broiling, the meat comes into direct contact with the heat. We turn the regulator to broil, and the top of the meat should be two or three inches from the source of heat. We'll leave the chops until they are nicely browned. Then we'll season the top side, turn and broil the other side. Only this one turning is necessary. Modern methods broil the meat instead of the cook. Be sure the platter is piping hot. Keep your guests waiting for broil chops if you must. But never, never keep the chops waiting for your guests. Now for our third dry heat method, pan broiling. 
I'm going to cook this slice of ham by pan broiling. In pan broiling, the heat reaches the meat through the hot metal instead of directly as in broiling. You won't need any fat and never any water. When the first side is brown, we'll turn it over and brown the other side. And you won't want to cover because pan broiling, remember, is cooking by dry heat. Now let's reduce the temperature and finish cooking. If fat collects in the pan, pour it off. We don't want our meat to fry. Now let us consider our two moist heat methods, braising and cooking in water. This good looking piece of meat is a beef pot roast. It is one of the less tender cuts. So to make it tender, we cook it by the moist heat method, which we call braising. We'll season the meat. Now we'll brown it on all sides in its own fat or lard, which has been heated in this heavy pan. We'll add just one cup of water. Maybe we'll need more later. But the secret of that rich, delicious gravy is to use as little water as possible. Now we'll cover it with this tight-fitting lid and reduce the temperature so the liquid will just simmer. Our second moist heat method is cooking in water. In this pot is some lamb cut into small pieces for a stew. It is nicely browned. Next, we cover the meat with water and cook at a simmering temperature. About 45 minutes before the meat is done, I'll put in these vegetables. But you don't always cut up meat to cook it in water. For instance, in this kettle is a ham shank I'm cooking. All I did was cover it with water and put on a lid. We let it cook gently until it is tender. We used to boil ham shank, but now we know better. Meat should never be boiled, just simmered. Whatever way we're cooking meat, by dry heat methods, roasting, broiling, and pan broiling, or by our moist heat methods, braising and cooking in water, the one fundamental rule in meat cookery is low temperature, always. You know, Peggy, our ideas are no longer based on superstitions or old wives' tales. Our modern meat cookery methods have been established by as painstaking research as any other branch of scientific knowledge. Who carries on all this research? A number of state agricultural experiment stations and the United States Department of Agriculture. Just a few weeks ago at the Bureau of Home Economics in Washington, D.C., I saw a highly dramatic presentation of what low temperature means in meat cookery. The test was conducted under the supervision of Dr. Louise Stanley, chief of the Bureau. There were two ovens side by side. One oven regulator was set at 300 degrees, the other at 500. There were two paired beef roasts. That means they came from opposite sides of the same beef. Each roast weighed exactly 18 and one half pounds, and each measured exactly 15 and one quarter inches. One roast was put in the 300 degree oven, and later the other in the 500. The roast cooked at the high temperature cooked in less time, but actually used more fuel. When the roasts were taken from the ovens, the meat thermometers showed them both to be exactly medium done. When the weights were compared, it was found that the roast cooked at low temperature weighed 15 and one half pounds, having lost three pounds in cooking. The roast cooked at the high temperature weighed only 12 pounds, having lost six and one half pounds in cooking. The drippings from both roasts were poured into graduated glass vessels, and there were two and one-half times as much dripping from the high-temperature roast, which partly explains all that loss in weight. Enough meat to serve five people was sliced off the low-temperature roast, and, believe it or not, it still provided as much meat as the roast cooked at high temperature. It was a convincing demonstration of the advantage of cooking meat at low temperature. Would the same thing happen in cooking pot roast? Exactly. The low temperature rule applies to every kind of meat cookery. How's it coming? When's dinner going to be ready? Oh, a little while. Want to help? Yeah. All right. Go in and sit down. Poor Bill, he's starving. Okay, let's hustle things up a bit. Mmm, mm, it's perfect. Just wait till Bill sees that. Boy, does that look good. A thing of beauty. All right, son, let's see what you can do. For heaven's sake, Father, don't sit there watching him like a hawk. 
Peggy, you're going to have to learn a funny story to divert your guest's attention from Bill's carving. Oh, well, I don't know. No, I mean it. That's one of the hostess's responsibilities. You'll get along better, son, if you'll steal that knife. I guess you're right, Dad. I should have done this in the kitchen. I saw a carving expert put on a demonstration at our community field house not long ago. Slickest thing you ever saw. The thing the expert stressed, first and foremost, was a sharp knife. His advice was to have the knife sharp to start with. After that, he said a dozen strokes with the steel will keep it in top condition. The first roast he carved was a leg of lamb. He placed it with a shank to his right. He began by carving several slices from the thin side. Of course, the thin side is the nearest or farthest from you, depending on whether the leg is from a right or left side of lamb. Then, he turned the roast onto the cut surface so it rested on a solid foundation. And, starting at the shank end, he sliced down to the leg bone. He cut the slices about a quarter of an inch thick. After they were cut, he ran the knife down along the leg bone to release them. The slices were all carved across the grain and were uniform in size. The expert stood up to carve throughout the demonstration. Etiquette, he said, permits sitting or standing as the carver chooses. Next, he took a baked ham, which is carved in the same way as a leg of lamb. He kept the decorated side up and the shank end toward his right. Cutting the first slices from the thin side. Then, he turned the ham onto the cut surface, which permitted him to slice easily from the shank end. Again, he released the required number of slices by running the knife along the bone. He also demonstrated another method of carving a baked ham. He cut out what he called the horseshoe section, which provided a boneless piece that is very easily sliced into attractive uniform servings. Next was a standing rib beef roast, and the carver advised asking the meat dealer to separate the backbone from the ribs so it can easily be removed in the kitchen after roasting. This makes the carving job a lot easier. The roast is simply set up on end with the ribs to the carver's left. The fork goes between the two top ribs, and the slices are made always across the grain toward the ribs from the far outside edge. Cutting close along the rib with the tip of the knife releases a slice. And if the roast is so large your platter won't accommodate all the slices, you can put them on another warm platter alongside. Slice enough portions for everyone before you begin serving. Carving a pork or lamb crown roast is simplicity itself. Just steady the roast with the fork and slice between the ribs. In a pork crown, one slice is usually removed from between the ribs. And two, there's a right way to carve a porterhouse steak. After cutting close around the bone, lift it out of the way. Then cut wedge-shaped portions across the full width so each surface includes a piece of the tenderloin. And should you sometime have more company than you have steak, you can serve the flank end. I tell you, Bill, a little better knowledge of carving and a sharp knife and Peggy won't need such a large stock of funny stories. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Bill, carving isn't something you just dust off for company. Practice on Peggy in between times. <laughs> That's a fine dinner, Peggy. Oh, well, thank you very much. Gosh, I was wondering if we should have served pork. Why not? Well, isn't it supposed to be less digestible than other meats? Oh, that's just another witch's tale. We learned better than knife years ago. As a matter of fact, all meats are readily digestible. Research has shown that about 96% of any meat is digested. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Incidentally, that meat we had for dinner has a very important place in the diet. Nutrition authorities have been concerned over an apparent lack of thiamine in the American diet. Well, just what is thiamine? It's one of the B vitamins. And now Dr. Elvium of the University of Wisconsin has found that as foods are usually eaten, pork is by far the richest source of this vitamin B factor. Dr. Elvium says one pork chop will provide a whole day's supply of thiamine. Oh, yes, I read about that. But what are B vitamins? The B vitamins are the ones... Doctor, at a time, please. <laughs> you tell her, Bill. Well, what we used to call plain vitamin B is really made up of many different vitamins. 
but because of similar properties, these are all classed under what is now called the vitamin B group. And thiamine, which we've called vitamin B1, belongs to this B group. Oh, I see. Oh, but Bill, why do we need thiamine so much? Well, because it stimulates the appetite, promotes growth, and protects health. You know, we find a lot of people who aren't really ill. They just don't feel well. What these people need is a balanced diet, containing, among other things, plenty of vitamins. Is that right, Dad? That's right. These people should push the B group. Thiamine, riboflavin, and nicotinic acid. Oh, but that's only three. Bill, you said there were many factors in the B group. Yes, they're still digging out the facts about the other. Well, then let's hear about these three, then. <laughs> All right, you ask for it. You see, we've learned there's usually a lack of one or more of these three B factors in cases of dietary deficiency. That's one reason why meat is so important in the diet. We've known for a long time that liver, heart, and kidney are rich sources of these vitamins. But now we know that all meats are excellent sources of the B group. It's all here in this little folder that I carry to correct some of my patients' odd notions about food values and diets. These charts show the results of research carried on by the United States Department of Agriculture and many universities. Well, what's this? That's the seal of acceptance of the Council on Foods and Nutrition of the American Medical Association. This vitamin chart, for instance, shows you the things we were saying about meat as a source of the vitamin B factors. Those vitamins appear in quite a number of common foods. Sure. You can see just which foods they are and compare the amount of any vitamin in a serving of each from this chart. Take thiamine. You find it in eggs, fruit, milk, potatoes, whole wheat bread, oatmeal, vegetables, beef, lamb and veal, glandular meats, and pork. Then there's riboflavin, the second factor of the vitamin B group, which promotes growth and protects against certain nervous disorders. And here are the principal sources of nicotinic acid, the vitamin B factor which prevents pellagra, a very common dietary deficiency disease. Well, what about the other food values? Like the vitamins, you find them in all common foods in varying amounts. That's why doctors are against food fads and advise people to eat a widely varied diet. Sure. There's protein, for example. We find protein in varying amounts in numerous common foods. And everybody in the world needs a constant daily supply. Youngsters need it for building body tissue. Adults for repairing and maintaining the body. Well, how do some of these foods compare on calcium? You know, I've always heard we needed lots of that. Correct. We need calcium for building bones and teeth. Oh, meat doesn't rank so high as a source of calcium, does it? No, Peggy. But the human system is funny that way. It can't utilize calcium for building bones and teeth without the presence of phosphorus and vitamin D. Right, Doctor? Right. And meat is an excellent source of the phosphorus needed to utilize calcium. Not that we don't get phosphorus in lots of other common foods. It seems to me I've heard an awful lot about iron, too. Now, what about it? <laughs> well, Dr. Minot says the lack of iron is the principal cause of nutritional anemia. And he ought to know what he's talking about. He shared the Nobel Prize with Drs. Murphy and Whipple for discovering the value of liver in the treatment of anemia. This chart shows that iron is provided by a wide range of common foods, and the outstanding source is meat, especially liver, with beef and pork liver leading the list. Here's the calorie chart. You might call it the energy chart. Calories are simply units for measuring the heat and energy value of foods. Well, then meat takes a high rank as a source of energy, too. Yes, meat is an important source of nine out of the 13 major food elements considered essential to good health. We all need meat from babyhood on. Now that baby out there needs meat. By the time an infant is six or seven months old, the supply of iron with which it was born is depleted. So we urge mothers to give these tiny mites bacon, scraped beef and liver. And we keep adding meat to the diet just as fast as a baby can assimilate solid foods. Active, growing youngsters need an extra supply of food essentials from the time they begin to walk. They need lots of good protein to build and repair body tissues. 
They need minerals, calcium and phosphorus to build bones and teeth, and iron to build rich red blood. Buoyant health demands health-protecting vitamins, and these youngsters need calories for the energy they burn up at vigorous play. That's why meat, which supplies so many of these food essentials, should be on every high chair and every adolescent's bill of fare. Adults also need all the elements of a balanced diet to maintain good health. The adult engaged in strenuous physical activity naturally needs more energy producing foods than the sedentary worker. But even the most inactive people need as much high quality protein as the most active. So every adult should have a liberal amount of meat to supply protein requirements. All people, regardless of sex, age, or occupation, everybody, as science now knows, thrives on meat. But if meat furnishes so many calories, it must be fattening. Oh, <laughs> not necessarily. Dr. Campbell's study at Rush Medical College in Chicago proved that people needn't starve themselves to lose weight. Dr. Campbell fed 27 overweight people three square meals a day. They ranged in age from a girl of 16 to a man of 65. They took off from two to two and a half pounds a week on a satisfying diet. Yes, sir, you should have seen the meals those people ate. For a woman of 161 pounds who should have weighed 135, they prescribed a breakfast of fruit juice, two eggs and Canadian-style bacon or ham, a slice of toast, half a pat of butter, and black coffee. Her luncheon consisted of a four-ounce serving of lean meat, beef, pork, veal, or lamb, a cooked vegetable and a salad, a slice of bread and a half a pat of butter with fruit for dessert, and a glass of skim milk. For dinner, she had a clear broth or consomme, an eight-ounce serving of lean meat, a cooked vegetable, a salad, a slice of bread and a half a pat of butter with fruit for dessert, and tea or coffee. That sounds like enough food for anybody, doesn't it? Oh, yes. But do you mean the people actually lost weight on all that food? Exactly. An average of from eight to ten pounds a month. Well, then, if you want to reduce, well, you can eat all the meat you want to. That is, if you just stick to the lean, huh? <laughs> That's the idea. Of course, lean meat with the visible fat removed still runs 15% fat, which takes care of the minimum need in the human diet for animal fats. Then we really must have fat. Indeed we do. Dr. Burr of the University of Minnesota has demonstrated that animal fats are the best source of certain dietary essentials. You see, Peggy, there's every reason for eating meat, even when you're trying to control your weight. Yes. It's the liberal quantities of meat in Dr. Camel's diet that makes it so satisfying. People on such a diet don't feel so weak and fatigued as they do on many of the reducing diets. I'd like to turn you loose on some of my patients, Dad, with their odd notions about what they can eat and what's bad for them. <laughs> I know them all, son. Have for years. Otherwise, sensible people, but they fall for food fads. And then turn up in your office. Or in a hospital. People who think they need special diets should consult a physician. Otherwise, just go along eating a normal diet. Peggy, with two doctors cluttering up your living room, why not ask them to prescribe this normal diet they keep talking about? <laughs> That's easy. Most people, thank heaven, are normal people. That means they should eat all of the common foods in variety. A normal diet is one that contains plenty of protein, fats, carbohydrates, minerals, especially calcium, phosphorus, and iron, and the whole alphabet of vitamins. What do you mean, the whole alphabet of vitamins? You served all the vitamins at dinner tonight, Peggy. Yes, Peggy. Meat, vegetables, fruits, dairy products, and cereals supply all the health essentials. The perfect pattern for a well-balanced meal. Bill, look at this. Doesn't that look good? A porterhouse steak, broiled to a turn. Bacon, an American favorite, is served in dozens of taste-tempting ways. Lamb chocolates made from the breast are different and delicious. A thick cut of round appears on the table as a delicious Swiss steak. 
lamb chops, tender and tasty, fit naturally into a mixed grill. A rich variety of ready-to-serve meats enables any homemaker to present a decorative platter in a jiffy. Economical cushion shoulder of lamb goes even farther when stuffed with a savory sausage dressing. Butterfly pork chops, with all of pork's goodness, provide that different touch. English lamb chops are for epicures. Flanked with vegetables, they merit their renown. And pork sausage links, you can almost hear them sizzle and detect that tantalizing aroma. Corned beef and cabbage, yes, sir. Jiggs was certainly right. Liver and bacon always hit the spot at breakfast, lunch, or dinner. A crown of distinction, a crown roast of pork. French leg of lamb is always a favorite for family dinners or any occasion. A gorgeous standing rib roast served with pride, hailed with enthusiasm. Bill? Bill? You're wonderful.